thank you for inviting us and it's lovely to be here. I've heard about this place and uh, now I'm in it and uh, it's nice to see each and every one of you. And I thank my pastors for coming with me today. I think they're coming to keep their hand on me, you know, but uh, it's lovely to see each and every one of you. It's not often that I'm asked to give my testimony because you're so used preaching all the time. But uh, will you turn to Psalm 27, please? Psalm 27. And we'll read from verse 10. This is the story of my life. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It's good sometimes to look back on your life. As Isaiah would say, the whole of the pit from whence we were digged. And some of us were digged out of the whole of the pit. But a pit came to my home, and by eight years of age, I was literally an orphan. Tuberculosis, in those days they called it the bug, wiped out my whole home. It was shut for, up for six years. Then my father was taken into the sanatorium with my sister, both of them, and they were four years in that sanatorium. And I roamed the streets. And uh, then my father got out of hospital and inside a year died of cancer. And my sister was still there. So my life was topsy-turvy. But I had a grandfather who was a godly man. And he took me to the Iron Hall Sunday School, which is in Temple Moor Avenue, Belfast. And there I heard the gospel. And my Sunday School teacher, Samuel Jemison, who later became a member of my church, pointed me to Christ. And then my life began. I walked the roads, literally walked the roads. And I began to seek God. And somebody asked me the other day, what is faith, James McConnell? Look at me when I say this. Faith is taking God seriously. If you don't take God seriously, you have no faith. If you don't take God seriously, you've got nothing. And I began to take God seriously as a boy. Then God anointed me, baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And I began to preach as a boy preacher. And of course, in those days, I'm 82 years of age, so you can reckon in those days, people came to hear the boy preacher. It was just, it was a novelty. And, uh, <laughs> But then, as I matured, God began to deal with me. I kept on serving the Lord, kept on seeking his face. And then I was asked to go to England to be a pulpit supplier 
for a man who went to America. And it was there that God visited me. I was 18 years of age. And uh, it was a small church. And the Lord gave me inside nine months 500 people. And I began to look after them. And it was there that the Lord visited me. And strange things happened in that church. Very strange things. Actually, signs and wonders and things that I cannot even relate to you tonight. Tremendous things. And then God brought me back to Whitewell. Or God brought me back to Northern Ireland. And here's what I want to say to you. Two servants of God came to visit me. And they said there, are, there is a little group of people down in Greencastle, Whitewell Road. And they'd love you to come and look after them. Well, the boy preacher had grown out of string of invites, Sweden, Finland, Canada, the United States. And the idea of going down to 10 people, I said, what? <laughs> and I just said, no, I'm not. And God began to deal with me. I forgot the rock from whence I was hewn. And I forgot the hole of the pit from whence I was digged. Don't forget. Don't forget. And the two preachers went away and they said, all right. And I was staying in the home of a servant of God. And he was angry with me and he says, you can wash the dishes. And uh, what happened was, while I was washing the dishes, <coughs> a dark cloud came over me. And I fell down on my knees and God began to convict me. Now you've got to understand, I came to the Lord as a boy of eight. I wasn't in the world. I wasn't doing great sins. But I felt for the first time in my life, conviction. Conviction that I couldn't handle. And I cried unto the Lord for mercy. I cried unto him for help. And I says, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. He says, I want you to go to Whitewell. So I waited on the men coming back. And I says, listen, I've changed my mind. And I said, oh, we've already asked him, man. I says, tell him he hasn't to go. <laughs> he says he'll be offended. I says, I don't care. I says, I don't want to offend the Lord. And they went and told him. And I went down there. Now this famous boy preacher was buried for the next 13 years. Nobody ever heard of me again. And I went down to Orange Hall with those 10 people. And the first Sunday morning, I remembered as well, 22 people showed up. <laughs> and that night, 60 people, which I was thrilled, showed up. And I said, oh, this is it. But for the next 13 years, God began to mold me and work on me and rebuke me and lift me and love me. This is what God does with his child. And I began to seek the Lord. Then we, we decided to get a building up. And we tried to get money in for the building. And uh, there was a, 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 a church beside us. I'm not going to name the church. It was a church beside us. And it was on a hill. And the man, he was a good man. He excavated the site for me. But he excavated it that much that the church put a court order on me. Because they were afraid of the church collapsing. Might as well have collapsed because it was doing nothing anyway. And... Uh, <laughs> And I remember as well that we had to build a retaining wall. Now we're talking in the early 60s. And that retaining wall it was down to eight feet. Concrete and iron in it. 
and it cost me two and a half thousand to three thousand. In those days, that was a fortune. My building program was sunk. But I kept on going and I kept on going. And here God gave me the building. But then, and I'm saying to this young pastor, and he's young, keep faithful. I began to walk the roads again. And God began to move on me. And one Sunday morning, I got up and I said, God has not called me to be a keeper of an aquarium. He's called me to be a fisher of men. And frankly, there are many churches today, and I just call them aquariums. The pastor gets up and gives the fish stuff, and the fish come up and eat it, and that's it. And I was bored, bored out of my head. And I began to seek God. Then I began to get talking to my people. And I'm not exaggerating, and I want you to listen to me and encourage the pastor here. I had prayer meetings from Monday to Friday, every night, for two and a half years, until God would visit us. There's no substitute for prayer. There's no substitute for the Holy Ghost. And night after night, I sought God and any elders that I had on a Saturday afternoon, I came down then and sought the Lord. And this was my program. After the prayer meeting, I rushed home. My wife made me tea and toast. And I walked right up Serpentine Road, right down Antrim Road, right down by the co-op, the old co-op in Belfast, right down to Shore Road. I'd done that every night. <clears throat> Seeking God, talking to God. And then I was interrupted because a police van was following me every night. <laughs> and I, I, well, I took no notice, but it started to follow me for a couple of weeks every night. And I remember one night I was seeking the Lord, walking past Belfast Castle, when the policeman looked out of the van and he says, are you finished yet? They knew I was praying. And I said, why are you following me? They said, we're worried about you. Because it was the time of the troubles, the shankle butchers were busy. And you all heard about the shankle butchers. And I got angry with the police because they were disturbing the prayer life. And I started to walk to pray, and I got a lift home every night in the police van. <laughs> and that shows you the intent. What was it doing? I was taking God seriously. I was saying, Lord, if you're real, I want you. And if you're real, I want to be real. I want a touch from you. I want to have your presence. I want to have your spirit. And God gave it to me. So I kept on seeking God. The church built up. We had 130. They thought that was revival. Well, when you think of 10 people, the 130, well, they thought it was. I said, no. I'm not satisfied. I kept on seeking God. So I began to seek God in the church. And then if I parked my car outside, people saw my car. And they wrapped the door and were disturbing me again. And I said, I'm fed up with this. So what I did was, where the White Whale Road is, I parked my car around the back of the White Whale Road. And I, there's a couple of women and I said, could I go through your back gardens to my church? They thought it was nuts. And they said, go ahead, park my car outside their door and go in there so that people would know I was there. That's what the Lord says when you pray in secret, your Father which rewards you in secret, he will reward you openly. But anyway, I kept on doing this. Let me get a drink. And one Wednesday afternoon, I got into the church, locked myself in. 
went up to the little gallery and a man appeared. I said, how did you get in here? He says, I can get in anywhere. And that man that appeared to me also appeared to me when I was a boy in Harlan and Wolf in the drawing office and spoke to me, the same man. Same man appeared in Gateshead. He has appeared at different intervals in my life. And he touched me. And he said, look this way. And I looked this way. And I saw people coming in. He says, from this hour I will bless you if you will keep faithful to me. And inside six weeks, from 130 I had 600. Inside a year I had 1,000. The following year, we started another building program. The church was too small. We knocked a wall down here and were able to put 90 people at that site. We pulled out the little gallery and we put another 60 people in that. We knocked this wall down and put another 90 people. In fact, we ruined the building. And I didn't ask for any planning permission, by the way. So, <laughs> but they kept coming in. The meetings would start maybe at 7 o'clock at night and finish at 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday night. No rushing away or anything like that. People were hungry for God. And then we started this next building program. And I kept walking the roads. That was the secret. The secret asking God to move. Depending on God, showing God. I remember one particular instance how God was bringing the people in and they needed taught. They needed taught. And uh, I began to teach doctrine, but I was frightened of losing my zeal for souls. And I remember walking up the Castlereagh Road, right at the hill foot, as they called it, and seeking God. I says, please don't take that away from me. Please anoint me. And the Lord anointed me. Do you know what God did? He took 10 people and he made them into three and a half thousand. That's what God did. That's what God can do with any of you sitting here tonight. You may feel insignificant. insignificant. Was there anybody ever insignificant as me? Who... Who had a plan for my life? There's nobody out there had any plan for me. I was an orphan boy. I had nothing. But God had a plan for me. Just as God had a plan for Jeremiah. He says, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you and ordained you. Not only did he know him, he ordained him. He was ordained in the belly. He was ordained in his mother's womb. And Little did I know that these things were happening to me and God was dealing with me. God began to work. Tremendous things happened. But I forgot to tell you in my youth, I had a trysting place. The school that I went to was Park Parade School and it was facing Ormo Park. And I went to Ormo Park every day and there was a fir tree in Ormo Park it's not there now, it's stripped. And I used to sleep under that tree. I used to pray under that tree. In the winter nights, I wouldn't go. But in the summer nights, I was seeking God. Even Nolan, Nolan wanted to see that tree. And I grabbed Nolan by the hand and prayed with him. He didn't know where he was. But I started to pray for him. And I began that, do you know what a trysting place is? I'll tell you, I'll tell you. It's an old fashioned word, trysting. Hands up, have you ever heard it? Thank God for two. <laughs> <laughs> a trysting place, I'll tell you what it's like. Say I'm going with a girl and the family don't like her, so they don't want me to go with her and say the girl's going with me and the family don't like me. So what do we do? We secretly meet. Isn't that right? 
we secretly make love. <laughs> well, make love, you know. And, and that's what I was doing, secretly meeting God in that tree. Secretly meeting God in that armor park that he might touch me and they might bless me. Now, that's the story of my life. Taking God seriously. And God anointed me and blessed me. Now, God began to bless. God brought in Pastor Michael. God brought in Pastor Frankie. God brought in, God gave me lovely men. And I was able to build the work with them. We had tremendous times together. And it was lovely. And they can tell you about those days. As Pastor Michael would say, we were on top of the hill. We were born in the fire. And it was amazing what happened. So one particular night, I was visiting up at Balmoral. And uh, I think it was Elton John was singing in the King's Hall. And they're coming out in their thousands. And I was at the traffic lights. And a voice inside me spoke. Can you fill it? I says, no, Lord. But we can't. He says, fill it. I'll be with you. And that was the first time that we ever went to the King's Hall. We filled it seven times. The church began to reach out in the midst of the troubles. In fact, the first night we turned, we turned hundreds away. They couldn't get in. And then we went to football stadiums, Windsor Park. 12,000 showed up there. We went to the Oval, Glen Turns uh, football ground, Seaview twice. Pastor Frankie is involved with Crusaders. He knows what Seaview's like. We went there, Inver Park and Larne, you name it. We filled the Odyssey twice. Thousands of people heard the gospel and thousands were saved. And I believe that God raised me up then and raised up White Well Church for a purpose in the times of trouble. Paisley was on the other side of Belfast, East Belfast. But a good relationship. It's not strange. He criticized a lot of preachers, but he never criticized me. And uh, we had a good relationship and things like that. And he knew that God was moving. Right, well, I'll tell you, there were some rows, there were 16 in a row. Let me illustrate this. 16 in a row and... Uh, I remember one Sunday morning in particular, I saw two lawyers, two IRA men, two UDA men, one UVF man, a doctor and a nurse all in that one row, all lifting their hands up to God and worshipping. It was fantastic. God began to bring them in from everywhere and blessed and undertook. Now that's my story. Of I, I preached my first sermon at 13. And I haven't stopped. I'm 82 years of age. And there's young men sitting here tonight. And let me tell you, if you put yourself in God's hand, it's wonderful what he'll do with you. You have no idea what he can do with you. He can lift you up. So, as David said, when my father and mother forsake me, because David was insignificant in his family, you remember that? How God sent Samuel to anoint the king? And seven of Jesse's sons passed by. And you know what the Lord said? I haven't chosen those. And then a 15, 16 year old boy bounced in with rosy cheeks and red hair and beautiful blue eyes. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. Now, God can do that with you, sister. God can do that with you, brother. If you have an open heart and an open mind, it's wonderful what God can do. Now, God did these lovely things. 
and I saw lives transformed. One leading judge, I'm not going to mention his name. I remember one particular night, there was 12 police Landovers. <clears throat> and I used to do the car park, it was a habit of mine. And, uh, and I said to Jim McCann, what's going on here? This judge, it was the time of the Diblock thing, and uh, this judge came. And he heard the gospel, and that night he got saved. And six weeks later, he was blown up, coming up from the south of Ireland. <laughs> That's the sort of people that God brought in to the place. They heard the word. God moved. God saved. Tremendous. There's one lady that Pastor Michael and I know. You called her Mrs. Black. And I remember at a watch night service, she said these words. You know, people were saying, God took me from the dunghill. She says, God dug me out of the dunghill. And you may be in a dunghill tonight. God can take you out of it. God can dig you out of it. God can change you. God can bless you. God can do lovely things with you. And that's what God did with me. After that visitation, when I was 1954, the 9th of September, 1954. I was a message boy in the drawing office. And I used to come in early and unwrap all the canvases from the, the drawing boards and stuff like that. So I was sitting at my desk and this man walked in with a woolly hat on. And I still remember to this day the wooden buttons on his coat. And it was the same man that visited me all my life. He stopped and he said, Look you here. He always said, Look you here. So I looked. He says, What do you see? And I said, I see a warehouse. And I see a man with a ridiculous looking can of oil filling big vessels. Some are big, some are medium, some are small. He says, good, you've seen well. Now, decide what vessel you're going to be. And he walked right through the doors. As Acts chapter 12 says about Peter when he saw the angel, he says, he came to himself. So when I came to myself, I ran through the swing doors in Sir Frederick Rabbick's office. And he says, what do you want, son? I says, I'm looking for somebody. He says, well, he's not here. And... Uh, and I went up, I had started a little prayer reading in a broken down bus in, in Harland and Roofs at Par Station Yard, they called it. And there was 12 young men used to meet there every day from a quarter to one to a quarter to two. Those 12, I was number 12, I was the youngest, they all went into the ministry. And God baptized them in the Holy Ghost. There was one boy, he was exclusive brethren. It's one thing to be in the brethren, but one thing exclusive. Here, God filled him with the Holy Ghost, and he was so drunk with the power of God, we had to trail him down uh, to the office and cover up for him. It was fantastic. It was wonderful. But I remember God blessing and filling us in that bus. Those were the things that God was doing there's so many things happened in my life, and it was wonderful. And then I remember one morning, I went to a little church, Bible Pattern Church, and, uh, and they gave me the job of putting the heat on. I had the heat on at 6 o'clock in the morning, and the service was at 11 o'clock in the morning. They were roasting when they were coming in, but I had the heat on. From six in the morning, opened the wee church, began to seek God. And this particular morning, I'd locked the doors and I was on my knees. And this woman came in. I she was a very wealthy woman. I just saw her, you know. Her name was Mrs. Cummings. And uh, she was chauffeur driven. 
chauffeur driven. You want to see her beautiful fur coat and all. And here I'm on my knees worshipping and crying unto the Lord. And she burst in through the door. I don't know how she got in. Had the doors locked. And she came and she laid hands on me. She says, the Lord will take you around the world twice. And it was fulfilled to the letter. God was taking me step after step, purpose after purpose, and leading me on. So what am I saying all this for? It can happen to you. Look at me. Every one of you has a capacity. Every one of you. Every one of you have a talent. There may be somebody here with five. You're blessed. There may be somebody here with two. But I know this, everybody here is one. Including those two wee boys sitting here. Everybody here is one. Give it to God. And it's amazing what God will do. Remember the man with the five talents? He gained five. So that meant ten. But the man with the one talent, what did he do? He went and buried it, didn't he? And then he appeared before the Lord. And what did the Lord say? Take the talent from him and give it to the man that gained five. So he had 11 talents. And it's amazing. If you have inabilities and you're being used of God, God will increase your ability. God will increase your talent. And God will bless you in every way. That's the reality of God. Get to know him. As Paul said, that I may know him. Huh? I count all things but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And this is what Paul says, I count it but dung all my academic abilities. He was a philosopher. He was a PhD. Paul was. He was brilliant. And Paul says, it's nothing compared to knowing him. Nothing to have his presence. Nothing to have the reality of his person in your life. I remember at those particular times uh, the church that I belong to did a number of churches and they used to share their conventions and uh, so it was Whitewell's turn to have a convention. This was the church at the bottom of the road, the wee church with a spar. And this lovely servant of God came with his wife. And they took the Easter convention. It was lovely and all that. People crowded in and all. It was great. So I was getting them ready to take them to the airport. And the lady says, Pastor, who else have you in this house? I says, sure the Lord's in this house and I'm, my wife and family's here. Start to cry. Says, we're conscious of someone observing us, watching us. My husband, he says, there's a presence here that I've never felt in my life before. They saw the angel of the Lord and felt the angel of the Lord that was in the house at that particular time. Various things like that happen. Tremendous things. What one organization sent two men down to shoot me. And uh, they came into the church at the bottom of the road. And we had a brother who had a little book stall, Charlie Purse. And... Uh, they sat at the book stall so that they could get me. And they said, we didn't know which one. He has a twin. And I says, Lord, if I got a twin, <laughs> if I got a twin, they say, he has a twin. They didn't know what to do and they went away confused. Strange things happened. God's hand was on me. God's hand was on the church's life as well. And listen, look at me, God's hands on you too. God's hands on you too. And remember what sort of hand it is. It's a nail pierced hand. It's a hand of love. And it's a hand that can rebuke you too. It can give you a smack. 
It's a hand that can restrain you. It can pull you back. And I thank God for that hand. He has saved me from doing many stupid things. He's a wonderful God. And I'm saying to you, trust him. Now, the only way that you can find that God is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't meet him, you'll never meet God. Do you hear me? If you don't meet him, you will never meet God. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, if you're coming to the Father, you've got to go by him. And maybe there's somebody here and you want to know about the Lord. First of all, put your trust in God's Son. He will change you. He will deliver you. And I know there's people looking at me very anxiously here tonight. He loves you and he wants you. And I'm saying to you, trust him and reach out to him because you never know what is going to happen to you because he can deal with you in a wonderful way. And that's what's been happening to me all my life. From I've been eight years of age to 82. Many years is that. You mathematicians, you can count that. <laughs> but that's it. That's what God has done for me. And young men, there's temptations out there. I know there is. But if you bring him into your life at an early age, he'll guard you, he'll guide you, he'll restrain you. In fact, he'll even interrupt you in many things because he has great things and wonderful things and lovely things in store for you. He's a wonderful Lord. So like David, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. That's what happened to me. If I meet David and glory, I says the two of us were the same cut of the same cloth when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. I think I've said enough. I've probably left out heaps and heaps of things, but I just wanted to glorify him because I'm looking to the rock from whence I was hewn and the hole of the pit from whence I was digged. And he can do the same for you tonight. God bless you. Lovely to talk to you. And thank you for your so earnest attention. I feel his presence. That same God's with me now. I feel his presence. That same God's with you. He's here. Let's bow our heads. Is there anybody in this service tonight, and I am not going to embarrass you in any way. Is there a man here tonight? Is there a woman here tonight? And you know you're not right with God, but you would love to be right with God. Would you let me pray for you? I'm going to pray for you quietly. We're all going to pray together. But is there a person tonight who would say by the lifting of their hand, Pastor McConnell, will you pray for me? Because I'm not right with God, but I want to be. If there's one, would you have the courage and the honesty to lift up your hand and take it down? And I will see it and pray for you. Is there one tonight? Is there one tonight? Can I see your hand? God bless you, lady. Is there another one tonight? Can I see your hand? Can I see your hand wherever you are? And I'll pray for you. I'll not embarrass you in any way or publicly. Is there anybody else? Will you just lift up that hand and that hand will say, Pastor, will you pray for me? And I will pray for you. Is there another one? Come on, sir. Come on, lady. Is God dealing with you? Is there another one tonight? Seems to be that maybe they're all believers here tonight. If there's not, 
And here's God giving you an opportunity. One has raised their hand, is there another? Would you lift up that hand and say, that hand will say, pray for me. Where are you? Is there, is there another one? Quickly, quickly and quietly, where are you, friend? Is there a young person here who would want God in their life? Just lift up your hand. Take it down, I'll see it. Is there another one tonight? Where are you? Where are you, sir? Where are you, lady? Is there somebody here who has wandered away from God? Is God speaking to you? You've wandered away, you want to come back. You lift up that hand. Lift it up then. God bless you, friend, to see your hand. Is there another one? Is there another one? Quickly and quietly. Quickly and quietly. Can I see another one? I'm not going to go on and on, but I'm asking. Is there another person? Is God speaking to you? Lift that hand. I'll see it. I'll pray for you. Because God is here. He's lovely. He loves you and he understands you. I'm going to ask for the last time. And that could be the last time. I thank God for the two people. But I'm asking for the last time. And it could be my last time. And it could be your last time. To get that opportunity. To get right with God. So I'm asking for the final time. Is there another one? Would you lift up that hand? Lift it up right now and I'll see it. And I'll pray for you. Is that it then? And I will be subject to the Holy Spirit that two people have indicated. Is that then? Now, would you look at me? Everybody, would you sit up and look at me? Would you put your hands out like this? Those two people, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to pray for us all. And I want you to repeat this prayer. Are you ready? Close your eyes and repeat it. Gracious and eternal Father. I come to thee this night in the name of your lovely Son. I come as a hell-deserving sinner, deserving your wrath, but I know that you love me. Will you take me as I am and save me for time and eternity? Cleanse me in your precious blood. And anoint me by your Holy Spirit. That from this night I will serve thee. And will live for you. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart and life. And make me your child. And I will serve you. Because I love you. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. God bless you, brother. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.